Wait till you see what we've done with the internet. We've got every gang from Seattle to San Diego working together now. They're not competing anymore. They're consolidated. The only thing we lack is a little overall leadership. And that's where you come in. Because people out there, they've got a lot of respect for you, Derek. When you're ready, you ought to come and talk to me about it. Well, you can forget about that. I'm done with it, Cam. Yeah, well, I know you grew out of that shaved head bullshit a long time ago, thank God. I like your hair the way it is now. You see, that's what I mean, Derek. We're thinking bigger now. No more of this fucking grocery store. You're not listening to me. I am done with it. All that bullshit out there and all your bullshit, too. I'm out. I understand how you feel. I mean, you've just done some hard time. Don't you fucking talk to me about hard time. You don't know a thing about it. Hey, I've done mine. You didn't do shit. I found out about your little prison story. You did two months, and then you rolled over on two kids and let them go down for you. So don't feed me your fucking lies, Cameron. All right. This is stupid. I'm done. You go cool off. Get laid. Do something. Get your head on straight, then I'll talk to you. Yeah, but it doesn't even really matter if I don't, does it? Because you got the next crop all lined up and ready to go, you fucking chicken hawk. Excuse me? You prey on people, Cam. You use them. I lost three years of my life for your fucking phony cause, but I am on to you now, you fucking snake. Hey, Gary, watch it. Be careful. Remember where you are. This is not some fucking country club where you can waltz in and out of here. Hey, shut just up! Huge. Shut the fuck up! I came in here to tell you one thing. I am out. Out! And Danny is out, too. And if you come near my family again, I'm gonna fucking kill you. Well, excuse me, but fuck you, Derek. You can't come barking threats at me. Look, you can do whatever you want, but Danny is a good kid. He's not some whining pussy like you. He needs my help, and I'm gonna give it to him. If you come near Danny again, I will feed you your fucking heart, Cameron. I won't have to. He'll come to me. I'm more important to him now than you'll ever be. You're a fucking dead man, Vineyard.
but because there's a particular small minority that is so well organized that white people don't even know the whole truth anymore. We don't even have the knowledge to win. Do you think this is an overt act by the Jewish community to um, prevent the publication of certain um, information? I'm not saying there's any detailed, uh, complex uh, conspiracy functioning behind rooms. All I'm saying is the Jews consider themselves a separate entity in our society. They always have. They're a very elitist group. They're very racist. There's more racist people on the face of the earth than the Jewish people. And uh, in fact, people all over the world know this. They stick up for their own interests and their own ideals. And it just so happens that their interests many times run counter to our own. Mm -hmm. That's why we have policies like we have in, in, uh, in regard to Israel. That's why we have policies as we do in regards to race mixing and uh, integration and busing. I mean, we have a campaign right now against busing. Now, integration is a program which has caused violence, it's caused the destruction of our educational quality, and eventually it's going to bring down the school system, a public education system that was one of the key factors in making this country great. And why has it been that the people that's been pushing the busing the liberal sociologists have almost always been Jews. Mm -hmm. The people that ran the court cases through the Supreme Court for busing were men like uh, Jay Greenberg, the NAACP attorneys. In fact, the NAACP until recently had always had a Jewish president, never even a black president. Why have they run the civil rights movement? In other words, they have been the brains and the, and the uh, key behind the anti-white efforts in America. It seems to me, Mr. Duke, that you referred originally to the beginning of this country. And it would seem to me that the American ideal is that we do not refer to ourselves as whites or Jews or blacks, but as Americans. If that is true, um, if that is the American ideal, why is it not possible just to refer to people as Americans and, and, and why is it not possible to accept everybody as equals? Why is it necessary to categorize them according to their uh, ethnic or racial background? Well, I'll challenge your premise. Uh, uh, this country originally was considered as a white country. Early Supreme Court decisions even discussed this and came up with that conclusion in the original Dred Scott decision and so forth. They decided, that the judges actually stated in their decisions that this was a white nation. This cannot be de denied. This was founded by white people. Thomas Jefferson wrote extensively where he said the blacks were not equal, were not the same as we are, and that they had to have their own state someday. He believed in separation. Most of the founding fathers of this nation owned slavery. I'm not that radical. <laughs> the Klan today does not believe in slavery, does not believe in suppression of anybody, but the founding fathers did. And in the Constitution of our country, Article 1, Section 2, uh, Negroes were equated as three-fifths of a person. So that's how our forefathers viewed the question. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, if anything, uh, we in the Klan today are not as uh, radical, uh, as pro-white, as our actual American forefathers were. But if the Klan had its way and the whites regained ultimate supremacy in all areas of American life, wouldn't this necessarily mean some kind of suppression of uh, non-whites? I don't think that it would. I think would it mean actual more freedom for them? Because I think in many ways as Lincoln so ably said that the races suffer in the presence of each other. They're having to conform to our standards and our ideals and our principles, and we're having to conform to some of their problems, like the tremendous black crime, like the destruction of our schools, like the tremendous taxes we all pay for black welfare and black government programs. And so I think that races uh, on both hands suffer, that if they have their own society, where they, when they go, have, go to court, they go to a black court and have a black judge. When they're stopped for an offense, it's by a, a black policeman. If they, uh, you know, have a, read a book, it's by black authors or it's for the black people. Mm -hmm. I think that's where you have the freedom involved. Each people is able to do, do their own affairs and run their own affairs without interference from the other. That's what I want to see. Right now, we have a tiny minority, the Jews, who are really suppressing both the whites and the blacks and using uh, both against each other for their own benefit and their own uh, aggrandizement. Functions it is to attract attention. Well, we wear the robes and hoods again because of the ceremony that's involved. Okay. What I'm saying, right. you certainly, are, if you're going to commit a crime, you're certainly not going to put a robe and hood on and go and go do it. I mean, everybody in the whole town is going to be looking at you while you're trying to trying to commit the uh, the crime. How much film do we have left? There was a time, Mr. Duke, that the Klan would all towns and villages with uh, their torches to get their message across. 
Klan. Some members have been known to lynch people on occasions. Not recently, but certainly it is there in the past and it is documented. You said a while ago that it is part of the rules of your organization not to engage in violence. If that is the case, how do you get across your message in these days? Do you have a newspaper or do you have a, a series of meetings, a radio broadcast, or, or what, what do you... Well, there's various have ways. Uh, not only through publicity and through interviews. I, I go on hundreds of uh, radio and television programs a year, interview programs, where I discuss some of these issues and get out to the American people. Also, we have a publication and it's, uh, it's called The Crusader, and this uh, is a monthly newspaper, and we discuss these, these items. Now, I've discussed a lot of things in this interview, mm -hmm. and I like to say anybody, uh, if, if you don't believe them or anybody out there doesn't believe some of my facts, I, well, I'll just send them one of these free. It won't even cost them a penny. So, uh, you know, if they want to get one of these, they can check any of our facts and our materials. Uh, they can just write to uh, KKK, Metairie, Louisiana, or Metairie, Louisiana, and I'll get it. And... Um, uh, and the thing is, our, all of our ideas are documented, and they're not just a bunch of crackpots. We're not just a bunch of people running around in the middle of the hills spouting some sort of racism. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we're educated. We base our principles on philosophy and ideology. We have scientists that back up our, our belief that the races are indeed different, that they're not exactly the same genetically. We have uh, documents uh, proving that uh, integration is destroying the quality of our education. Uh, many, many research studies. In fact, many of them were sponsored by the left, trying to prove that integration was a good thing, showing that it was, was indeed a bad thing, causing violence. We have documents on the Jewish control of the media and documents concerning uh, our poor policy in places like the Middle East and how it's against our national interest. And I just say this, if anybody doubts what I say, uh, they can just write and uh, we'll be happy to send them uh, free documentation on any of these subjects. Okay. The, the credibility of your organization is in doubt, though, and I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this in many circles. It would probably have more credibility if more men and women of national prominence were members, or at least uh, were supporters. Why is it, do you think, that the leadership of this country in, in all areas, the arts, the sciences, the political arena, any area you care to name, does not have one person who is clearly identified as a Klan member. Well, here, you're answering an earlier question that you asked about the secrecy. That's where the secrecy comes in. We do have some people who have been leaders, both in the academic community, uh, both in the former political community, and both in the entertainment field. And the reason why they don't come out openly is because of exactly what happened to uh, Mary Bacon, uh, one of a person, the, the one of the most famous women in the world, one of the ten best known women in the world, the jockey, lady jockey, who once it was discovered that she had affiliation with the Klan, uh, she's, all her contracts with cosmetic firms were cut off. All her, uh, they were going to make a movie of her life, and this, this was cut off. And uh, many of her, her opportunities to ride horses, again, and compete athletically were cut off. Mm -hmm. So naturally, people are not going to stand up against some of this Jewish power today if this is the type of harassment that they're going to face. And this is what she has faced. So that uh, we have a lot of people, every time I do a radio or a TV show, whether it be in California or New York, I have somebody call me who's, who's in the media or somebody call me who's in the radio and television or the movies, you know, and they discuss it. And I've got a lot of friends in those fields, mm -hmm. and, but they can't come out openly, and I, can, and I wouldn't expect them to because, uh, you know, I'm not asking them to give up their occupation and their jobs and, and all, all what they've worked for. We have retired admirals and generals that work with our organization. We had a retired admiral that addressed uh, our recent national convention, Admiral McMillan. We've had uh, many people uh, address the organization and work with us, and some join who have been very famous and have been, you know, titans, you know, in, in their own respective fields. You're, you're saying, in effect, there's a form of reverse discrimination. All right. Let me say, give you this example. Uh, one of the associate editors of our newspaper is for, former uh, Admiral John G. Cromlin. And this was the man who was called the hearts and the guts of the carrier enterprise during World War II. Now, that's just not some funky from podunk uh, of South Carolina. That's a man who's who distinguished himself in courage, heroism, and intelligence for this nation, who's now an associate editor of our publication. I think you've answered the question. All right. This is the last question, and it is in the form of a footnote. 
Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but were you not once a member of the Nazi Party? No, I was never a member. I've distributed literature for any different group. I've never been a member of it. But I can tell you this, I wouldn't be opposed to any group that stood up for the white race in this country. And if I was a Nazi, I'd be, I'd be proud of it. Because I think that white people have got to unite. That no matter what our opinions are on, on the other subjects, white people in this nation and the world have got to unite. The third world is led by communism. They want to destroy us. As long as white people fight among each other, we have no chance of winning. Mr. Duke, thank you very much. All right. Hold it, hold it right there. We got to get the cutaway shots. All right. Yeah. Cutaways, please, gentlemen. Thank you. you. Find off. Do you find them in an adversary position most of the time, uh, and you find defending yourself all I'd the time? Say most of the time, uh, they're just trying to find information. Mm -hmm. I took some journalism courses myself mm -hmm. know, in school. That's how I was taught to do it. You're, you're there to ask questions to find out exactly what his position is, not to argue with the man, not mm -hmm. to refute the man or try to put him down. Uh, I'd say in about 30% of the time to 40% of the time, you have somebody who is pretty antagonistic are absolutely, you know, absolutely opposed to you and mm -hmm. just trying to ask the only questions they ask are ones that are they that they're trying to have reflect badly upon you and um, then i would say about 10 percent of the time mm -hmm. you have people that are just absolutely unscrupulous in the way they uh, uh after they do the interview the way they chop it up they edit it they uh you know uh, change things around they just will do anything to uh, put you down like the Luke Gordon program I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier I flew to, they, he flew me to Detroit for that show and uh, it was a 45 minute program well I got there in the station he talked about five minutes and then he put on a videotape for 25 minutes uh, that fellow Gary Allen Rowe yeah and this videotape sign you can't argue with it you can't argue with the points you just got to sit, sit and listen to this man this uh, paid informant you know mm -hmm. saying all these things about the Klan in the 1960s course which you have no involvement in anyway but you know you couldn't even refute his positions and then when you when you come back on for the last 15 minutes of the program the Gordon's also attacking you plus the program you don't even get a chance to really comment for even five minutes straight on on what happened on the videotape so you feel you're there more as an exhibit rather than as that's a what source happened. of information you know, that isn't done to other types of people now, I can mm -hmm. see showing a videotape for five minutes you know and say what's your, what's your comments on this not for 25 minutes of a program yeah and you know with a man not even there so you can argue with them or, or you know cross-examine cross-examine them or anything else so that's a good example another thing too i'm out there i'm out there openly honestly my name my address my phone number is unlisted and i you know i can back up what i say you know and i'm and i'm not don't have anything to hide and then uh, another case a good example is this is michael jackson the jewish uh a radio commentator and also a TV Angeles. show on the West Coast. He's got the most listened to radio show in the United States, from what I understand. And uh, he, to us, that's fiction. The people that are killed are like the communists. When Jane Fonda was on your program, you didn't bring up to her about all the millions of people that the communists have slaughtered in this world and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could just change those two in your hand as you talk. And uh, so then, uh, uh, after the program's taped, yeah, and we had about nine people watching it in the video room. Uh, after that's done, you know what he does? No. He doesn't air it. So I flew out there. I was out there three days, cutting the program, you know, mm -hmm. doing the best I could on the show. He did the best he could. I came out on top, so he didn't air it. Now, you can call out the program and ask him, mm -hmm. you know. And if they say, well, because I used obscene language, you know, I think, you know, that's not true. If they say I've used no, unprintable okay. stuff in the air. Ask him to, you know, well, let's just ask him if you can uh, see a video cop, uh, videotape. He works with ABC. Let me ask you uh, something else for the record here. Um, it's not part of the formal interview, but it is for information. Mm -hmm. When you recruit people and when you're talking to your members, do you make it a point to play down the violence angle? Do you, do you, is it, in other words, I'm sure you must get some people who want to join because they are bully boys and strong arm and they like to go out and knock heads. Do you refuse membership to those people, and do you make it an absolute precondition that Absolutely. they do not engage in violence? Absolutely. In fact, uh, we do more than that because of the media image of the Klan. We have to guard against that more than any other organization, you know, really would. And so we let people know exactly that we're here to do political work, to organize. And we tell them that someday it may come down to a fight. 
You know, it may, it may come down to be using your gun to protect your home and your family. Mm -hmm. It looks like it may happen in this country. And uh, we tell them that, but we tell them that we expect you to be completely law-abiding in, in this organization and to abide by our rules and precepts, and if you don't, then you don't belong in the organization. As simple as that. Can you be, um, have your membership revoked if you do Absolutely. not you follow can, the you uh, can be banished rules? You can. from the organization, sure. Who are the uh, illegal immigrants in this country? We found over 14 million illegal immigrants in this country today. Then you see this as a period of uh, revival then for the Klan. Oh, absolutely. Uh, extreme left liberals and militants. Mm -hmm. And when you can see people such as Joan Fonda and others that have fought and have gone to Hanoi and have uh, cohorted with the enemy, as they have, uh, being satisfied with Jimmy Carter and uh, seeing all the promises that he's making and seeing the peace and tranquility with people such as Andy Young and many of the other black militants, you know that something has been hatched up and there's been some kind of a deal. So I think that the Southerner, he, he, he certainly took advantage of the fact that he lives in Plains, Georgia. He's indicated that he was a Southerner, but at the same time, uh, you can see from his Playboy activity and interview that uh, he certainly played the good old southern Baptist for a fool and got their support in behind him along with the blacks and the aliens and uh, so then where else do the, does the basic uh, southerner and the people with our philosophy uh, we have no place to go how are you going to um get your message across in the future? Is it going to be through public appearances and speeches and radio programs? It, it will be through, uh, as we've always done, and people uh, are always asking the question, well, why do you go to the cow pasture? Well, at least in the cow pasture, we know what to look for before we step down. <laughs> when you're involved in buildings and dealing with the public officials, uh, they'll let you go up to the last minute and cancel the building on you, so therefore you're having to battle the political manure of the politicians. So I'd rather go out in the cow pasture knowing what I'm going to step in to start with. At least it's a group of white people and it's fresh air. Well, we're going to use every means and method at, at our disposal, whether it be through interviews, news, radio, uh, newspapers, public appearances, and speaking before various civic groups, uh, any way that we can to get the message out to the general public. So the invisible empire is going to become a little more visible. It's going to become more visible. It's going to be broken down into various classes. There will be individuals that will identify themselves as members of the organization. They will be available for speaking engagements. Uh, there will be other individuals that will be kind of semi-known. Mm -hmm. And then there, of course, will be the individuals that because of job security and things of this nature will remain as they have many times in the past, uh, strictly secret. How about the um, the infiltration of your ranks by informers and uh, people like that? Have you been able to clean those up? Or? Yes, and this is our concern of the right-wing movement. Uh, uh, it's always been amazing to me as to why, with the forces that the right-wing has had in the past, why we weren't able to be more effective. Uh, some 12 or 14 years ago, after I had a plane crash, and we found that the plane was sabotaged, and there was some involvement with the federal government at that time, but, of course, our hands were tied. We couldn't get the word out, anything of this nature. I began looking to more of an in-depth into the harassment by the federal government, and I was amazed to find that the FBI and the CIA and other agencies was taking a key role uh, in the right-wing involvement. And this has been my concern over the past five to six years uh, because there are too many people in the right-wing that are not right-wingers, and certainly we've got to develop a mean and met means and methods to clear the right wing, separate the men from the boys, and, and I hate to say in many cases some of the queer type individuals out of the organization. And I, I feel we've been very successful in the United Clan in doing this. We, uh, some five years ago, uh, deployed a system of using uh, lie detectors in our organization, and we have a very effective program, and every member is subject to uh, going through this uh, screen situation. And uh, when you're not able to catch them, uh, the threat of them being caught is scared most of them. I think that the price is pretty high for an informant to be with the government at this time because they never know when a committee is paying a visit and they're put on the machine and given an mm -hmm. examination. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we've been able to pretty well clean our organization up. And uh, I'm interested in seeing the sincere people in the right wing having the opportunity to clean it up also and get some of the Nazi-type uh, philosophy out of the right wing, 
Uh, I don't think that you can take a, a Nazi-type movement with that philosophy uh, and build any kind of an organization or allow them to associate with you and, and you build an organization because of the uh, probability that about 80% of the individual potential members of that organization has had to oppose the Nazi regime on the battlefields of Europe. Mm -hmm. And certainly this is not the philosophy. I'm, I'm for pro-American and not anti-American. All right, Mr. Shelton, thank you very much. Thank you for coming, sir. We'll get you to sit here just a minute while we got some different angles. Yeah, that one has some pretty good... That was some of the resolutions that we adopted up in Pulaski. Let me just give you a handful you. of them there. Oh, it's all one issue, aren't you? Is this a weekly or a monthly? Or a monthly, yeah. <laughs> Well, this isn't a political party, but I met with, for instance, the League of St. George, which is a right-wing group here in Britain. How about the National Front? I didn't meet any National Front uh, leadership. I've met some uh, members, but no more so than I say I met Tory members or uh, liberal members. Or did you come on your own hook, or did you come at someone's invitation? I came on an invitation from Klansmen here and from invitations from right-wing uh, individuals here in England. And how large is the Klan in Britain? It's very small, and uh, Britain's got a sizable population, and proportion of the population is very small. Mm -hmm. But we're very, we've grown, and I say in the last couple of years, we've about doubled our size. We've got a lot of people in universities. Where are they, for example? Well, I was down at uh, Surrex, and we have Sussex some, University. Yeah, Sussex, excuse me. I'll get it right. Uh, and uh, we've got some members there, and we've got some supporters. In fact, some of our supporters even suggested uh, that I speak to the student body. Uh, this was turned down. I think that we're losing freedom of speech a lot in the, the Western countries. I think in America and Britain that a lot of our rights of freedom of speech are, are being curtailed. It surprises me that you've come to Britain and not seen members of the National Front who are most patently and most obviously the most anti-black organization or anti-non-white organization in this country. It is with them your name is most easily identified. Well, you know, like I say, I've, I've seen some people who might be in the front, but I've also seen people in other parties. Uh, the point is there, the National Front's very nationalistic in scope. It doesn't really have a worldwide picture, <clears throat> although they do support uh, the white Rhodesians and the white South Africans in, in their struggle. Generally speaking, they are nationalistic in vain. So they would not be probably the first organization that we would align ourselves with here in Britain. You must surely be aware, Mr. Duke, that this country is going through a difficult period with regard to its race relations. It's become a popular public issue, both uh, within establishment politicians and with non-establishment politicians. Isn't your visit here at this time just out and out inflammatory? I don't think that it is at all. Uh, in fact, again, I think that, I hope that Britain does not go and take the same bad steps that America has taken over the last few years. Britain is at an earlier stage than America was a few years ago. And if the British cities become like American cities in terms of the minority crime and the, the problems, in terms of the educational breakdown, if Britain becomes like America in these, in these ways, I think it would be a tragedy uh, for the people here, in fact, for white people everywhere. Hasn't that crime occurred to pick just one difficult city, Detroit, wherever there has been an economic desire or factor which has divided the races rather than kept them together? I don't really think so. Um, for instance, the northern cities gave the Negroes the greatest opportunity uh, in the last, uh, say, since the big turn of the century. And yet the northern cities is where you've had the worst problems. Uh, there were no Negro riots. There wasn't a great deal of Negro crime when there was this so-called oppression, you know, that existed upon them. Uh, generally speaking, too, that two-thirds of the poor in the United States are white by HEW figures. Now, it's true, a greater percentage of Negroes among Negroes are poor, but two-thirds of the actual poor are white. And yet Negroes are committing, by the last FBI crime figures they gave according to race, a majority of the serious crime, robbery, murder, rape, you know, assault, and so forth. I think the crime is tied with race. Here in Britain, I talked to a prison warden, and uh, he told me that his pop the population of the prison that he oversaw was 60% uh, non-white. 
And here in Britain, where the blacks are even a, a much smaller percentage of the population than they are in the United States. Can I come back to clan numbers in Britain for a moment? Bill Wilkinson, yet another representative of yet another branch of the clan, says there are 500 members of the clan in Britain. Is that high, low, or accurate? I wouldn't comment on that. Why do you not comment on your numbers? Well, it's part of our uh, heritage. It's part of the tradition of the organization. I've got to abide by the bylaws. I mean, when I take my office, I was elected to my office, and I've got to abide by those bylaws and rules as much as anybody else. How much of it has I'm to do to with visibility? I'm trying to get that changed, and I'm hoping to get it changed in a couple of years. How much does that have to do with fear of visibility? Does the Klan work better privately or publicly? Well, I think part of the thing is this. We do believe that we're heading toward oppressive periods in Britain and America. I think we believe 1984 is coming, not just in date, but in, in reality. For blacks or for whites? Well, for anybody who dissents against government power. And so we're not going to give out either numbers, our, our membership figures, or names, or anything like that. In other words, we're going to try and maintain a low profile in those areas as much as we can. I must confess I'm suspicious. Uh, isn't it That's serious assaults in public schools. Mm. I think people <coughs> in the spectrum are going in the schools, you know, attacking mm. whites. I wonder if you think there's any chance. Well, let me ask again. You, we were talking about numbers, and I said I was suspicious. I suppose I'm suspicious that people who don't reveal to the public their membership figures are also in a position where they can hype those numbers as well. Well, you know, I think if we were trying to do that, then we would we, we could give a hyped up figure. It would be easier for me in terms of the press to say, yes, we have such and such uh, a number. Yeah, but I'm not disguising the fact that in terms of the populations of the countries that we are a small organization, uh, politically almost insignificant. But we're growing. And I think, but more importantly, I think that we represent a tremendous percentage or a tremendous, uh, at least significant, a proportion of the sentiments of our countries. Is your visit here intended to be clandestine? It, it was on a low-key basis to meet with people. It was never intended to be, uh, the, the press jumped on it. I was dealing with one press person with a mirror, but the story was so distorted that I talked to a couple other people in the press, and I do want to get the, the true story out now that if, if they're going to put distorted stories in the press, I'd better them to get some of our positions, so that's why I'm talking to some of the press now. If you were asked to leave, would you? I would fight it legally, on a legal recourse. I, again, if there was an ec equal uh, policy there, I wouldn't mind. I mean, uh, he, why would they single out people of my persuasion? Why not single out the communists? They have not stopped the communists from coming in here, many of them from Eastern European countries, mm -hmm. responsible for murdering masses of people before. You know, what's the difference? And here's another thing, too. They've got non-whites coming into this nation to live. They, many of them uh, spit on the traditions of, of England. They want to change the political structure here. They, do, they want to change the cultural basis of the country. And that's fine. But if a white person of British descent comes here to British as, uh, visit his British brothers and talk with them, you know, oh, we can't have that even on a visit. So I think there's a double standard there. And uh, I think that there's a, a higher morality to which I'm following. There have been a number of uh, clan inspired demonstrations and incidents here, as you know, which in some instances have terrified blacks and in some instances have made the authorities very nervous. Do you take any credit for inspiring those? No, I don't. And this is one reason why I'm here. Um, the, so far, the only way the British people have had to judge the Klan is through the Hollywood image, which I don't think is an accurate image. It's an image portrayed by people who are enemies of the organization, not, not unbiased third parties. And as a result, first of all, the Klan is the oldest racialist movement in the history of the world. And a lot of young people, and people in general, when they see this racial problem, they turn to the Klan as an answer, or they want to become members of the Klan, or they might even adopt their own Klan-type organizations. What's the motivating factor? Well, again, the race issue. What's happening to their culture, the attacks on their culture, their economic structure, uh, their values. They the, think... Put another way, the ease with which one can identify with other... Do you want a two-shot or one-shot? Two-shot. All right, but what we'll do then is... David, just have you sit there and nod knowingly for just a second. This is David Duke, who is the national director of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. You can just nod your head and agree with that, which is one, as I understand it, of three factions in the United States, with Shelton's being essentially the largest, and you and Cheney from Indiana then being the, the other two. Is that a fairly accurate assessment? Well, I don't think so. I think that uh, Shelton was the biggest group in the 60s. 
I'm certainly not against him or in any mm. way, but uh, today I think by far ours is the largest Klan organization in the world. How large is it? Well, as you know, you're dealing with Klansmen, you don't give out, we don't give out our figures, but we're active in almost every state. Uh, we have about units or members in about 36 countries, about every country with a sizable white population aside of the Iron Curtain. And uh, over the last four or five years, I've been on about 700 radio and television programs. Mm -hmm. We've reached really millions of people. We've got hundreds of thousands of inquiries in, and uh, we've really grown quite rapidly in the last two or three years. In fact, you're widely known uh, among people who disagree with you as a public relations man for racism. Well, you know, I, I think it depends on what you call racism. If you, if a racist is a person who hates others and wants to put them down or oppress them, I'm not one. But if you define a, a racist as a person who loves his own race and wants to preserve it, his own culture, and wants to advance those ideals, then I am one. In that way, maybe I am a public relations uh, man. <clears throat> Can I come back just to the numbers for a second so we have the background in order? The, the FBI has stopped keeping close tabs on the Ku Klux Klan, but the Anti-Defamation League still monitors you as closely as it's possible to do. The, so, And they say that perhaps you have two to 3,000 members and that in terms of national or even international effectiveness, you're not very effective. Well, again, the Anti-Defamation League, the whole purpose of that organization is to put down and attack anybody uh, that stands up for the white race or challenges some of the Jewish power that exists in the world. And uh, so I would expect them to say things that would try to lessen our importance. At the same time, uh, Joel Brinkley just recently did an article, and he got ADL files, and they said that the Klan was a real threat, and that I was a threat. And the last ADL articles that I read was that the Klan had changed its image, and indeed that uh, the Klan was becoming respectable in the United States and elsewhere around the world because of the uh, things that I've done. They've admitted this. So they say one thing one time and one thing another time. So There's no doubt that you've had publicity, at least, about changing the Klan's image. <clears throat> Does that make your message any less virulent? I don't think the message is one of hate. I think it's one of uh, really love. I love the traditions of our Western civilization, our culture, our system of government, art, literature. And I think these things are intrinsically Caucasian or European in origin. And I think it would be a tragedy if the European race is not preserved. I've got two beautiful little blonde-haired girls and blue-eyed girls, and I, would, I think it would be a tragedy if, if people like that would stop gracing this earth. And I think that this is what we're facing in the future. We find uh, the non-whites of the world reproducing at a fantastic pace. We find uh, massive non-white immigration into the United States, into Canada, into Britain, and other white countries of the world. You find white people taking birth control and having very few children. And what's eventually going to happen is the white race will become uh, an endangered species, so to speak. But Mr. Duke, as you argue it, <clears throat> to retain the Caucasian European quality of the Western world means in a situation like the United States or Britain that the blacks have to go. Well, I think in the United States we're pretty much, we, we believe in a voluntary separation. That is that we should not force people together. Uh, the whites should be able to have their schools, the blacks their schools, and if a few people want integration, a minority, which it is a minority in the country that want it, they should have those schools available. In Britain, I would be more in favor of a repatriation program because most of the non-whites have come here very, uh, well, in a short period of time. And I think that in Britain it could be accomplished much, e much easier than in the United States in terms of repatriation. So I would agree with British politicians who have called for repatriation here like uh, Enoch Powell. The image of the Ku Klux Klan and certainly your visit here has set the teeth of moderate and liberal Englishmen on edge should it have? No, I don't think so. Um, some of the press has referred to me uh, before as a Martin Luther King of the white man. And Which press has ever referred to you as that? In the United States, some of the papers. But I wouldn't, um, what I'm saying, I think the reason why I have, I'm certainly not agreeing with Martin Luther King and many of his concepts, but I do believe in nonviolence. And I've always preached nonviolence and legality in these things. And I'm in Britain, I've said this in every interview, that I'm urging the people who believe in the white race to not resort to illegality, but to stand up and work politically for their opinions and their ideals. Why have you come to Britain? <clears throat> Why do you even belong in well, Britain? Well, part of the reason, well, I think that I belong in any white nation. I think that uh, the bond of blood is, is greater than any, uh, I think, national boundaries. Part of the reason is to offer assistance to uh, the British uh, movements here that represent the white race and are also organized in terms of our own membership that we have here and our own units we have here. 
The main thing I'm here to say is that mm. to the British people is that they are not alone. That the problems they're facing here are similar problems faced all over the white world. That we will offer whatever assistance we can, whatever knowledge we can. That we need to unite, so to speak, to solve us to solve these problems. Who have you seen here? Well, I've seen a number of uh, members of organizations, supporters of organizations. What organizations? I've also seen people that, well, the Klan. I'm talking about Klan membership. But I've also seen uh, some people in a number of uh, political parties, not necessarily leaders, but just rank and file membership. Like what political parties? They're people who simply regard non-whites as being inferior. Different is a better word. But they mean inferior, don't they? Well, in terms of our culture and our values, yes. I think that the white man is best suited for European culture, art, literature, science, systems of government. I think the blacks are best suited for theirs. But it, what it really boils down to is whether we have the right to pursue our own values, you know, unhindered. But the point is, these young people, they see this Hollywood image of the Klan, and they think that they're being good Klansmen then by going out and committing some violent act or some terroristic act. And I'm here to tell them that they're not being what we want them to be if they do this. This is the Hollywood image. We want them to be upstanding, law-abiding, and change people's minds, not beat them over the head, but change their minds through argument. Mr. Duke, I must confess to you that some of us have personal memories of the Ku Klux Klan, which are to the contrary. Many of the reporters who covered the southern United States in the 1964, 65, 66 period. Well, I'm not do saying you that, or do any members of the Klan still continue to lynch and beat blacks in the southern United States to terrify no, them in the night? No, sir. In fact, in our organization, we've been over backwards uh, to be legal. In fact, uh, we take an oath now that we swear we will not commit or conspire to commit an illegal violent act. I mean, that's how far that we've gone. And we'll expel any member that we feel is, is committing these illegal acts. And do you think the people in Britain who now espouse your cause understand that? Yes, they do. I mean, that's one reason why I'm here. And like I say, a lot of these people are just independent, starting their own independent clans by what they read in their history textbooks and what they see in the screen. And I'm trying to change that into more of a positive response. I'm trying to make them understand what the clan is really all about historically and not, uh, not what they've heard so far. Does race really come before everything else? I think that race is the foundation stone of, of a society, of a nation. I don't think that we can maintain America, or Britain, or Canada, or any European civilization or culture unless we maintain the white race. In other words, I believe if we lose the white race as an entity, that we're going to lose our culture. And everywhere in the world where the white race has been, where the white race has been kicked out or replaced or whatever, you found the cultures, again, change. The standard of living go down. For instance, in every black, there's no black nation in Africa where they truly have a right to vote, where they have the right of jury trial when they're charged with an offense. How can 3% of a population, as it is here in Britain, non-white, threaten the supremacy of a nation with 97% and all of the building industrial, economic, social infrastructures? Okay, first of all, I think it's more like 6%, but you're right, it's a small... It'll be 6% by 1980. It's, it's, it's presently 3%. It's a small figure. But we're looking more to the future, what's going on there. And 6% can be significant, and the 6% can swing elections. 6% six can, can be a fantastic uh, block vote and so forth. But what's more important is the future. That is, again, I'm talking about this increased immigration, increased birth rates among non-whites, and decreasing birth rates among whites. So eventually, that 6% can be transformed into uh, really 50%. America is facing some interesting uh, things right now. For instance, uh, California will be a majority non-white, has been bragged by the lieutenant governor by about 1980. You know, and that's, that's not far away. How do you think you would do? Tom Snyder says you're intelligent, articulate, and charming. Barbara Walters says she disagrees with you, but you're a very effective spokesman. Candace Bergen says you're a fascinating, extremely interesting person. You're also good-looking. How would you do if you weren't all those things? I don't know. I'm just trying to tell the truth the best way that I, that I can. And uh, it's been a very, very hard fight for me. I've had to suffer a few times. Uh, I've been attacked often. I guess my life is under danger. But I really believe in this thing. I really believe in my people. And I don't want to see them uh, lost. Another issue we didn't get into, of course, is, is, is Zionism, which is a worldwide issue. And I'm meeting with people about that. Uh, all over the world, they're putting the interests of Israel, the Jewish people, over that of the West, over that of uh, the, issue, the interests of the people in our own country. In fact, the members, the opponents of the National Front here in Britain, which overwhelmingly regarded as a neo-Nazi organization, 
campaign against them saying never again. In fact, it sounds to me like you are advocating again. Well, I haven't said that, but if the Jews can be the most racist people on earth, if they can stick together and fight for their own interests, if they can put ads in their publications saying, around the corner, around the world, we are one, then why can't the white people of the world do the same thing? And why this hypocrisy? What I'm just saying is that each people should be allowed to pursue their own values and their own ideals. I don't think that this nation should be, in Britain, I don't think it should be run by a small Jewish minority. I don't think it should be run by small uh, other minorities for certain purposes. I think the majority will should prevail. The same is true in, in America. Andrew Young goes to South Africa and says because the Negroes are a vast majority that the country should be oriented toward their needs, economically, mm -hmm. socially, in terms of the language, educationally, and every other way. And most of the people around the West applaud this and say, this is really great, you know, they have that right. But what about us? Do we have that right? Merlin Reese, the Home Secretary, who originally had, in Britain, who had originally intended to keep you and others, as he said, like you, out of the country, has now decided that you're a nut and that you're not worth pursuing. Does that reduce your effectiveness in terms of public relations, publicity? You're on a publicity campaign at the moment, aren't you? Well, not really. That's not really what I came here for. But I say, my only answer to his comments uh, is this, that I, I think that if he had me in pocket, they would issue the deportation order. But they don't want to issue the deportation order and they'd be in a situation where that I'm, I'm walking the streets and, and going around London and Britain because then they would be very embarrassed. I think the It would undoubtedly give you a good deal more publicity. Well, it, it just may. But the way to answer that, by calling somebody a nut, the way you argue with a person's ideas, I think, is to argue with their ideas. When you have to resort to abuse, you know, I'm certainly not using that kind of abuse on him. I think that it shows that your own arguments are very weak. He knows that he's in a bad situation. He knows that he has an inconsistent policy. If they keep out me, they should keep out the communists. He's not doing that. And he knows that more, the more exposure that there is, the more inconsistency and the Ill illogical nature of his policy will be exposed. I don't disagree with you, Mr. Duke, about the value of the conflicting free speech. It just seems to me that your visit here at this very moment, because you're well aware of what's happening in Britain, is intended to capitalize on it, is intended to exploit racial division, is intended to incite hatred of blacks by whites in this country where the ball is already rolling. Again, I, you have a hard time convincing me otherwise. Again, it is not hatred. I have not spoken hatred here, but it's a love of our own traditions. Isn't that a euphemism, Mr. Duke? No, sir, it's not. I'm not motivated by hate. It would do me no good to be opposed to somebody and fight my whole life against something. I'm fighting for something. I don't think there's anything more beautiful, more wonderful to fight for than my people. I think our, our race is unique. I think it's beautiful. I want to preserve it and all the great aspects of our race. And, and if that's hate, then I guess I'm going to have to go start back from square one. Maybe so. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Got this office. Well, they don't fit into our civilization the same as white people do. Because they don't fit, they start getting frustrated. You know, the frustration leads to neuros neurosis, and neurosis leads to violence. <laughs> I mean, that's a, put a, put a, it's put pretty simply, but I really believe it's true. They, they never really adjust. They never really become truly happy in our environment. I think that shows by some of their suicides and so forth. Today, they're given every opportunity. In the States, the white man's a second-class citizen. In major cities, you can pick up the newspapers, and there'll be two pages, six columns wide of ads for, let me come on, for skilled or unskilled laborers, and most of them favor the minorities to fill their EEOC quotas. Yeah, but I mean, it is, that may be true on one hand, but it is surely patently untrue that the white man is a second-class citizen in America. Are, are I don't feel like one. But, well, maybe you don't, and you're a little older, but take a young person starting out. He tries to get a scholarship. There's two sets of scholarships. One for, uh, uh, only for minorities, only for non-whites. The other set only for, well, for everybody. They don't have any sets just for whites. And the ones for everybody have special qualifications for Negroes. They give them special ways that they can qualify for the scholarship. They yes. go to school, the entrance to colleges, you have the same thing. Mm. When it comes around to employment and these companies come around, the standing you have in your school is not as important as whether you're black or white. If the recruiters come around, they got to get the certain number of blacks that they need and to fill up their quotas. Then you get a job and it comes time for promotion. <laughs> if you're white or black, who do you think gets the promotion? It doesn't matter what the qualifications are. They got to get that black and they move them right on ahead. That's Let me ask you a couple of these questions again, Mr. Duke, which, okay. as you know, is purely a technical exercise. Right. In a situation where race has become such a contentious issue in Britain at the moment, isn't your visit right now just plain inflammatory?